Long ago, before this day's confusion did begin Throughout the stars did we go wandering Distance was no barrier And time it had no hope Free to come and free to go Free to come and free to go Open up the book everyone and welcome to Karmic Evolution's Astrologically Speaking podcast. I'm your host, Sherry Horn Hassan of Karmic Evolution Astrology and I'm coming to you on June 14th, 2024 from karmicevolution.com or any of your favorite podcast stations. Now before we get into this week's astro news you can use, my usual quick reminder that the show aims to bring you the truth about astrology and your soul's karmic evolution. And that a new show drops every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern, again on most major podcast, podcast platforms. So a reminder that I'm still offering my 75-minute Karmic Evolution Natal Insight reading for only $125, which is a discounted rate available to podcast listeners only. So if you want to learn more about the true meaning of your individual birth chart in order to gain greater consciousness about your soul's true mission and purpose in this lifetime and what may be holding you back from achieving it, then this reading is for you. If you feel stuck, frustrated, or otherwise stymied in your relationships, career, or other areas of concern and want to learn why that might be, then this reading is for you. And if you'd like to understand how, by letting your unconscious script, based on old soul conditioned behaviors from the past, run the show now, and you want to become more conscious about how to change that script going forward, then this reading is for you. My reading is designed to help you move from chaos to clarity through astrological insight and to help you co-create your own future happiness. And if that is something that you desire, then this reading is definitely for you. Conscious awareness has never been so easy or so affordable when you take advantage of this special Karmic Evolution Natal Insight reading for the discounted price of $125 for 75 minutes. The offer is available at karmicevolution.com slash karmic125. Again, that's karmicevolution.com slash 125. Um, I'm sorry, slash karmic125. All right, also two quick reminders. Tomorrow... Saturday, June 15th at 1 p.m. Pacific and 4 p.m. Eastern Time, I will be a guest on the live New Horizons podcast with host Ray Couture and other guest astrologers Robert Wilkinson, who you may have heard me quote from time to time on this podcast. I have a great deal of respect for him. And Elizabeth Hazel and moderated by Carmen Viola. We will all discuss our individual astrological insights about the 2024 summer solstice charts set for Washington, D.C., London, and Jerusalem. And that is available to listen to live at newhorizonpodcast.org. Um, hold on a second, because I think it's New Horizons Podcast. Let me double check. Yes, it's New Horizons, with an S, podcast.org. And this event is free. So if you cannot listen, I hope you'll be able to join us live tomorrow. But if not, it will be recorded and available on YouTube at that same address. That's New Horizons Podcast.org, <laughs> with an S, not a Z. Um, all right. 
Um, I hope to see you there. As host Ray Couture notes that we are in an exceptionally dynamic time in human history, so this event should be a real eye-opener given the aspects coming this summer. And if not, feel free to listen to the uploaded recording anytime, as mentioned. Now, in addition, I'd like to remind everyone also that I'm giving a lecture for the Arizona Astrology Group on Saturday, June 22nd, at 1 p.m. Pacific and 4 p.m. Eastern, titled The Fight for Women's Equal Rights in America, the U.S. Chiron Return, and the 2024 U.S. Presidential Election. This talk will first delineate the deeper meaning of the natal Chiron aspects in the U.S. Sibley birth chart and the nation's history of woundedness related to women's equality or inequality in terms of partnership. We'll then explore the incremental historical gains and setbacks for women's rights made during each of the first four U.S. Chiron returns, culminating with the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision in 1973. The question now becomes what to expect as transiting Chiron retrogrades back and forth, continuing to activate this natal T-square. We... Um, we talk about um, the Chiron configuration, which is what ty Chiron is tied into. And Chiron squares the U.S. Sibley sun and uh, uh, Venus uh, and opposes its Saturn Juno. So it forms a T-square then. And that began back right before in April of 2022, about two months before the Dobbs decision came down from the Supreme Court that did away with Roe versus Wade, and it will continue until February 18, 2025. We'll discuss that and how the issue of women's equality may impact the next U.S. presidential election on November 5, 2024, when transiting retrograde will once again be minutes away from its second exact return and its exact opposition to Juno, known as the wife or partner, on November 7th before it makes its final exact return on February 18th, 2025, as noted. Okay, I don't know what's going on with me, and you'll see a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but um, for some reason, I'm mixing up my dates. So what I want to say now is that I'm going to talk about how the issue of women's equality may impact the next U.S. presidential election on November 5th of 2024, when transiting Chiron retrograde will be minutes away from its second exact return and its exact opposition to Juno, which I just noted is the wife or the partner in, um, in classic Greek mythology, on November 7th, before it makes its final exact return on February 18th of the following year. So we'll look at the implications also of the just past April 8th, 19 degree, 24 minute Aries full moon solar eclipses conjunction to the U.S. Chiron, which is at 20 degrees Aries and uh, eight minutes. And that's the solar eclipse that cast its shadow across the continental United States. We'll look at it to see whether or not women voicing their past pain and suffering will bear fruit at the voting booth. This lecture will explore through astrological insight whether American women will rally and their supporters and use their hard-earned right to vote to both save and restore their individual right to bodily autonomy and equality for the future. The fee for this lecture is $10 for Arizona Astrology members and $15 for non-members, and you can register at AZ Astrologers, that's AZ as in Arizona, Astrologers with an S, azastrologers.org slash donate. Again, that's azastrologers.org slash donate. So uh, June 22nd at 1 or 4 p.m. or anything in between, depending on where you live, and I hope to see you then. All right, so let's get into this week's astro news you can use. So we're right now in the waxing first half of the Gemini New Moon lunar cycle that began on June 7th, a week ago, since we experienced the first quarter gener uh, Gemini New Moon waxing monthly lunar cycle square to the Virgo moon of the Virgo moon to the Gemini sun 
which happened late yesterday, June 13th, or early this morning, June 14th, depending on your exact time zone. Now, given the mutability of these two signs, along with the fact that we had five planets, the Sun, Moon, Venus, Mercury, and Jupiter in Gemini, and six planets in, in the air signs, when we also count Pluto in Aquarius, there's been a great deal of information bandied about. Remember, the Geminian archetype at its highest form is about information that serves as elementary building blocks for us to use to build a foundation to get to higher learning. It's the ABCs. It's the one, two, threes. The main thing to understand about the Geminian archetype is that it does not analyze or fact check information. It simply passes it. And because this archetype is more about originating, passing, or receiving information, and not necessarily verifying it factually, it can devolve into gossip or the type of miscommunication or disinformation that results from something like a child's game of telephone. I've mentioned this before on previous podcasts, but not for a, a long time. So for those of you who don't know uh, what the game of telephone is, that's when one person whispers something into the ear of the first person in a long line of people, and that then person, that person then whispers to the next one and so on until they get to the last person in the line. So what's inevitable or inevitably proven true when you play this game is that by the time what's been originally whispered gets to the end of the line, say of eight or 10 or 12 people, it's completely different. And by that, I mean distorted. So it pays to remember that when we're listening to gossip or he said, she said type conversations or simply information based solely on one individual's biased perceptions, then we need to be aware that we might have to verify the factual basis for that information. And when I say biased perceptions, and I've said this before also, we're all biased. It's not an insult. We're biased simply because we all have our own experiences, our own points of view, which are born out of those experiences, and that these incorporate into our psyches differently. Some of that may have to do, I mean, we can analyze that based on our psychological signatures um, astrologically, which is a lot of what I do when I do natal chart readings. But, um, but basically, we, we, we all have biases. And I think, you know, what the current times have proven is that a lot of us are grouping together with the same set of biases, right? <laughs> Especially when we have so many conspiracy theorists out there. But I digress. So we are just past experiencing this mutable first quarter waxing lunar square. And that has a lot to do with the Virgo moon creating the kind of tension that occurs in a square, right, to the, the Gemini sun when the Gemini archetype has gone off half cocked, as my father used to say, and is spouting information that like I said, has not been factually verified. So Mercury ruled Gemini, collects and passes information, while Mercury's Virgo takes that information and categorizes it, fact checks it, and analyzes it in order to come up with a logical, factual conclusion. This square, however, marks the early point of the Gemini new moon monthly lunar cycle. And I pointed out last week you know, a new moon, we look at the positive attributes of the archetype in play. And I said last week, Gemini is a mutable sign about communication, about siblings, about the local area, the neighborhood, local transportation, early childhood learning, or what I call elementary learning. Um, so it's usually associated with the lower grades of schooling. But, um, the positives are that Gemini is very mentally agile. It's very adaptable in its thinking, right? Which is why when we get to the shadow side, sometimes it can seem fickle. But the point is that a new moon is really going to talk to us about planting seeds that result in the positive portion of that archetypal energy. And that I also pointed out last week is about listening, right? So if each of us have our own perspectives 
or we join with groups that share our perspectives or biases, right, then we all um, need to listen to each other without making assumptions and, you know, forming an us versus them kind of mentality, right? So, I mean, that's not just a shadow side of Gemini alone. It has a lot to do with Aquarius and things like that when we adapt certain ideologies that are fixed, you know, based again on certain biases that are based on our actual personal experiences, things that we were taught, told, or forced to believe, which has a lot to do with Saturn or any of the Capricorn planets or angles or 10th house in our charts. Regardless, as I was saying, this square, this first quarter lunar monthly square, points us back to the beginning of the cycle on um, June 7th when the luminaries had Venus, um, that where they were conjoined to Venus, the symbol of values, and had Mercury separating from Jupiter in Gemini. And that's an exaggerative energy, right? Um, and they were all approaching, well, the, the Mercury and the Jupiter were approaching the Sun, the Moon, and the Venus in Gemini. Um, and so again, we've been asked to plant seeds that allow us to, to both discuss and listen to different points of view more openly, but without the bias, right? Because they might enable us, as I've said numerous times now, especially last week when I really delineated the entire April New Moon monthly meanings, to discover without bias where our true sense of ethics and morals really lie. What are our true values deep at the bottom or the core of our soul? Now, something I failed to mention last week about this lunation, though, is that the only planet then in an Earth sign was Uranus and Taurus, and the only one in a fire sign was Mars and Aries. And this counts, when I say that, I'm counting only the major planets. I'm not counting angles. I'm not counting other body, uh, bodies as such as asteroids um, or dwarf planets, but I do include Pluto still as a major planet, as do most of my astrologer um, compadres. So a lack of Earth in general can signify not really feeling weighty or important in this world. It can lead to a kind of sense of inertia or a, a kind of somatized depression, right? Something we, we, we're most definitely seeing now in places like the U.S. Congress and in polling from people who are asked who they want to vote for, you know, those who are sort of checked out and don't really know, they're, they're more swayed by this Geminian kind of, I think I heard that someone said that maybe, right? So there's not much fact in that, right? Um, and, you know, this is combined too with the fact that this past week, up to yesterday, or was it June, uh, up to June 7th, I'm sorry, June 12th, Mercury square to Saturn, right, we had, which I pointed out last week, we had um, the Sun square Saturn on June 9th, and that followed um, Venus squared Saturn June 8th, the Sun squared Saturn June 9th, and on the, um, on the 12th, Mercury squared Saturn. So, that already accounts for a lot of things that have been stalled, slowed, stymied, or ceased because Saturn restricts and constricts. And you'll remember that, as I just mentioned, last month's May 7th Taurus New Moon asked us to recommit to our deeper sense of values, morals, and ethics, and what we consider to be justice. So, for now, with all this Gemini energy still in the air, for the past week, we've been discussing exactly what those are. What are our deeper sense of ethics and morals and justice? However, when we experienced the Mars and Taurus fixed square to Pluto and Aquarius on June 11th and June 12th Mercury square Saturn, which is the last of the third in that series last week, which, as I already noted, followed the June 8th Venus-Saturn square and the June 9th Sun-Saturn square, our ability to believe what's factually true versus what, is, versus what is not may have been subjected to a good bit of stalling 
and attempted coercion by the turn by the time um, this first quarter square lunar square occurred. But I also uh, want to say that a lack of fire in the sky um, or in a natal chart can represent a kind of bipolar energy where you are either very active or very depressed, right? So again, there is also a somatized kind of energy in that because we can, we can feel like um, we have a lack of energy. Uh, we can feel helpless. We can feel angry or kind of certain amount of rage and aggression. We can become obsessed and we can also um, perhaps exhibit the opposite side of depression, which is mania. All right. So again, I think combined with these recent squares to Saturn, we're more likely to be depressed. And I think that we've seen in the collective, especially when we're talking about politics, especially when we're talking about the U.S., but not only, and I'll get into that in a minute, we see a lot of rage and aggression, right? Um, retribution is in the air, right? I spoke about that last week. I spoke about Trump's chart and Regulus on his ascendant being quincunx by Pluto and how, according to the piece that I read by Judith Cowell from a couple of years back, uh, she delineated the meaning of um, Regulus as the fixed star, the kingmaker, that you will only take the fall from grace if you're a person who's accumulated a great deal of power if you abuse that power by enacting revenge on anyone that you feel might have wronged you. So if you haven't listened to that podcast from last week, you might want, you might want to go back and check it out because there's a lot there about that, which, as I said at the time, really helps me reinforce my faith in my belief in astrology, because I do believe that Donald Trump, with Regulus so prominent in his chart, given his history, given what's going on now, is taking that fall from grace right now. There are several states, two of them, I believe, and I think it was Nevada is one of them, and I can't remember the other one, which are currently reviewing, because they have, as part of their laws, their state legislature laws, that they cannot nominate for president a convicted felon. Now, given the state of affairs, they may well rationalize a way to change that because they have the power, if they have a Republican majority, to change that. So we'll wait and see whether that happens. But it is kind of interesting to note, right? So um, before I go any further, because I'm going to start to talk about the Mars-Pluto square, which I mentioned last week. First, I want to apologize for a blatant error I made last week when I said that Mars and Taurus was going to exact square Pluto and Aquarius on July 11th. And not only that, I named that date as the one when Donald Trump is scheduled to be sentenced after 12 jurors found him guilty of 34 felonies on May 30th. Now, Mars, which entered Taurus on June 8th, where he'll remain until July 20th, which is the day before the June 21st Capricorn full moon and the summer solstice, perfected his fixed square to Pluto in Aquarius actually on June 11th, not July 11th. And here's what Rob Hand, my favorite astrologer that I love to quote, has to say in his book Planets in Transit in part about a Mars transit to Pluto uh, by square. Quote, this transit can signify a serious conflict between individual energies and the energies of a group. In this case, you may be a member of the group or you may be the individual. In either situation, this confrontation will be a significant test of the strength of your intentions. Depending on how badly you may want to do something, you will either fight for it harder or give up altogether. As you strive to get ahead, be careful that those in power over you do not oppose you. They are stronger now, and you would probably lose a confrontation. So this is interesting. On June 8th, as this square's energy was waxing, the Israeli military freed four hostages 
but the surrounding area came under heavy fire, generating chaos and panic, according to eyewitnesses. So according to the Associated Press on June 10th, after the fact, quote, Israel's dramatic weekend rescue of four hostages from the Gaza Strip in an operation that local health officials say killed 274 Palestinians came at a sensitive time in the eight-month-old war as Israel and Hamas weigh a U.S. proposal for a ceasefire and the release of the remaining captives. Now that has been uh, a proposal has been held in abeyance in part, I would say, it's related still to the after effects of these squares to Saturn, the last one on June 12th, only two days ago, but on June 10th, also as the uh, Mars-Pluto square energy was waxing, we learned the results of several major elections from around the world, one in France, where after a right-wing party gained ground, President Emmanuel Macron has challenged voters to test the sincerity of the support for the far right. And uh, the headline in the New York Times that day said, In calling elections in France, Macron makes a huge gamble. The president, and I'm quoting, The president has challenged voters to test the sincerity of their support for the far right in European elections. Were the French letting off steam, or did they really mean it? Shock coursed through France on Monday, that was June 10th. Um, The stock market plunged. And Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, a city that will host the Olympic Games in just over six weeks, said she was stunned by the unsettling decision. Now remember, I said Uranus in Taurus was the only planet in an Earth sign. Right? Uranus is always unexpected change. Taurus is value. So an unexpected change in values that led the population to vote in right-wing um, you know, uh, rulers. And the piece goes on, a thunderbolt thundered La Parisienne, a daily newspaper, across its front page. For Le Monde, it was a, quote, jump in the void. Raphael Glucksmann, who guided the revived center-left socialists to third place among French parties in the European vote, accused Macron of a dangerous game. Well, it sounds like a Mars-Pluto aspect to me, especially since the Leo moon opposed Pluto and Aquarius late on June 9th, just the day before this news report. Also on June 10th, again the day before the Mars-Pluto square perfected, the UN Security Council passes U.S.-backed Gaza ceasefire resolution, which I said, the resolution laid out a three-phase plan that begins with an immediate ceasefire. Neither Israel nor Hamas has formally embraced the proposal. And to date, I do not believe, I believe that's still true. Again, the squares, the Saturn, particularly Mercury and the Sun, square to Saturn recently. Um, It said, um, oh, it says the UN Security Council on Monday adopted a U.S.-backed ceasefire plan for the Gaza Strip after Russia opted not to block it, adding extra heft to a growing international push for an end to the fighting. Fourteen of the 15 council members voted in favor with Russia, which has veto power, abstaining. And now on June 11th, again talking about the Mars-Pluto square, Reuters reported that, quote, President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, was convicted by a jury of lying about his illegal drug use to buy a gun, making him the first child of a sitting U.S. president to be convicted of a crime. Wasn't well, that interesting? Because we have the first former president to be convicted of criminal crimes, you know, crime, or well, I guess the crime is criminal, right? <laughs> um, so I thought I'd take a look at Hunter Biden's natal chart and see what's what there. Um, He was born on February 4th, 1970, at 1.46 p.m. in Wilmington, Delaware, with a ninth house Aquarian Sun-Venus Juno Juno conjunction, or stellium, an eighth house Capricorn Moon-Mercury conjunction, and a Cancer rising, squared by his 10th house chiron mars Eris conjunction in Aries, which opposed his fourth house, Uranus, in 
Li uh, Libra. Is that right? Let me double check. I'm, d I'm not sure if that's right. Whoops, where did he go? Hold on. Hold on. Here he is. Yes, Uranus and Libra. Yeah. Uh, Chiron's at three degrees something minutes. Uh, Mars is at 8 and Eris is at 11, all in Aries in his 10th house, although Eris is pretty close to the cusp of the 11th, uh, which again is the legislature, and Uranus is in the 4th house at 8 degrees 33 minutes. So there's a pretty tight conjunction, there's a pretty tight opposition between his Mars and his Uranus, with the other uh, two bodies there as well, and they square as 1 degree 27 Cancer Ascendant and Capricorn Descendant. So, um, you know, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty easy to see how that Chiron, which is the wounded healer, which represents wounds that we've experienced, is conjoined to Mars and to Eris, which is a lot of... Um, Potential violence, chaos, right, in the 10th house, opposing his Uranus, the planet of unexpected change, surprise, shocks, in his 4th house, which is family, represents the sudden loss of his mother, especially given that in psychological astrology, we give the 10th house to the mother, and the 4th, in this case, would be one's home and one family, the Midheaven and Imam Kolam, which is the usually the fourth house cusp, right, tenth to the fourth house, is indicative of one's parental relationships, and all of those are squaring his ascendant descendant axis of relationships. So his Aquarian Sun, Venus, and Juno, the latter sign, as I said before, a partnership known as the wife, um, in his deep eighth house of trust represent that his trust was wounded when his mother was suddenly killed in an automobile accident. And remember, his moon is conjunct Gemini. Read local transportation. In the serious sign of Saturn ruled Capricorn um, when he was a young boy. So I'd imagine, given that Chiron, Mars, Eris opposition to Uranus really confused his son, Venus, Juno, because his son, Venus, Juno, is like, I love you, you know. Um, but it confused his sense of how to trust that a deep, loving relationship might actually last. And a Capricorn moon, which is known to be kind of lonely, right, would would perhaps given some of his other aspects, send him into wanting to escape from the pain of the realization, or, well, perhaps not realization consciously, right? That uh, the person that I love, one of the people that I love the most is my mother, and she just is gone, right? How can I trust that anyone is going to stick around? So maybe I'll just check out, right? This is not uncommon for people who experience uh, issues with addiction, right? Addiction is an escapist tendency, and I'm not putting any blame or any judgment on anyone. I'm just saying that um, we could see what he was potentially trying to escape from. And I don't know his history with drugs when he started using them or anything like that, so I can't speak to that. But in any case, his transits on the day of his conviction show that transiting Pluto was at 1 degree 44 minutes of Aquarius in his, and Pluto's retrograde, in his 8th house, squaring his natal 2 degree 59 minute Taurus Saturn in his 11th house. Again, an aspect that occurred from the house of deep bonding and trust to the unexpected, sudden, potentially shocking, but always surprising Uranus ruled 11th house, which is also the house of the legislature, which makes the laws under which Hunter Biden was tried and convicted. So transiting Mars, in addition to its square to transiting Pluto in his eighth house, was also transiting Hunter Biden's 11th house and conjoining his natal Saturn there and beginning to oppose his natal fifth house Jupiter in Scorpio. Now, Jupiter in Scorpio, too, you know, in the fifth house, Jupiter in the fifth house, which is naturally ruled by the sun and carries the archetype of Leo on its cusp in the natural chart, is a risk taker, you know. There's a couple of signs here that he, he may have been 
very much a push-pull person because he has Saturn opposite Judo, uh, sorry, Saturn opposite Jupiter. Jupiter, one foot on the gas, Saturn, one foot on the brake, right? Jupiter in the fifth house, the sky's the limit. Let's do it. Let's gamble. Let's go to the casino. Let's take a risk. Saturn in the um, 11th house. No, no, no. What will people say? What will people think? You know, might not have any friends. Oh, screw it. I don't have any friends anyway, right? I'm a lonely kid. So interestingly, Jupiter is his only planet in a water sign, which indicates that while he feels very deeply, he most likely keeps his emotions to himself. And this would lend credence to the fact that his cap Capricorn moon indicates that he had a potentially lonely childhood or one during which he felt isolated. He did, after all, spend months in the hospital following his mother's death due to that car accident. And according to Wikipedia, and I quote, Hunter Biden and his older brother, Bo, were also seriously injured but survived. Bo suffered multiple broken bones while Hunter sustained a fractured skull and severe traumatic brain injuries. Both spent several months in the hospital, during which time their father was sworn into the U.S. Senate in January 1973. The other thing that's kind of interesting, although, you know, not something we would ever attribute without knowing this fact, is he's got a Capricorn moon conjunct um, Mercury, right, or the moon conjunct Mercury and Capricorn, right? So his father, after that accident, after being sworn into the U.S. Senate, I think he was at a Saturn return, 29 years old, refused to drive between Delaware and Washington, D.C. He, uh, I don't know what he does now, and now he's in Washington, so it's a moot point, and he had, was for, you know, eight years while he was vice president to uh, Barack Obama, but he would not drive a car. He took the train. So it's very interesting that we could attribute that a little bit, you know, you could feel that fear, right? Saturn oftentimes can be fearful or insecure, right? Thank God daddy's not driving in a car like mommy was when she got hit and killed, right? Anyway, um, I'm not going to predict what's going to happen because I don't really know. There's part of me, I mean, the South Node, the transiting South Node's on his IC so it's just entering his fourth house. So, you know, I, I kind of feel like when it comes to sentencing for him, there may be a lot of empathy because there are so many Americans, including judges who have children who have experienced addiction to drugs. And, um, you know, there are some questions because he's already filed an appeal, as, as will Donald Trump, you know, for their verdicts. I think this is another, I mean, people are saying that the fact that Donald Trump was indicted um, and convicted, um, and so is Hunter Biden, that the law works, right? It's not biased. The law doesn't choose between Democrats and Republicans or president's children or former presidents, you know. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard that if you uh, are news listeners, right? So, again, Taurus full moon giving us that planted seed that says all men and women are created equal, which we know is not true, but it's a not that it's not true. We know that it doesn't always work that way under the law because people do not adhere to the law the right way, right? We have biased judges and things like that, biased Supreme Court judges and all of that. I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, I was going to talk about Sam Alito, but I don't think I'm going to have time. So I want to look at his chart with everybody too. Just uh, what I find interesting about him is he's got an Aries moon and quite an angry wife, but we'll talk about that another time. Anyway, um, also on June 11th, as the Mars-Pluto square perfected, Donald Trump met with his probation officer, which was a requirement of the court after his guilty verdict, as he's now a convicted felon. And on June 12th, when Mercury squared Saturn exact, the day after the exact Mars-Pluto square that has been talking about on June 11th, the New York Times wrote, and I quote, Trump defense formally asked New Jersey, I'm sorry, New York judge to ter terminate gag order. Again, we're in the waxing phase of the Gemini new moon with all that air in the, in the sky at the time. 
The former president's attorneys argued in a 21-page motion made public on Wednesday that Trump must be able to speak freely as the presidential debate nears and his rivals discuss his legal issues during a peak time in his 2024 campaign. Trump and his lawyers have argued consistently that their client has a right to defend himself publicly and to exercise free speech as the leading Republican candidate for president in this year's election. The motion claims that Trump's foes have weaponized his conviction and have taken advantage of his inability to respond. Like the Republicans are not weaponizing Hunter Biden's conviction, but again, that's another story. The article continues, and I quote, Prosecutors have repeatedly cited an urgent and continuing need to protect people related to the case, including the judge's family, after Trump's rhetoric resulted in safety concerns. Trump was still free to speak about Marshawn, the judge, and Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, whose office handled the case. He routinely did so and continues to speak about them at campaign events and in social media posts. So, you know, you want to talk about the nature of the waxing he said, she, he said, she said, Gemini New Moon? I mean, it's, it's laughable how accurate it is, right? And on June 12th, there was this from the Washington Examiner. Former Donald Trump advisor Steve Bannon has filed an emergency request to avoid reporting to prison on July 1st after he was sentenced in October 2022 because he defied a House January 6th committee subpoena. The request was filed in a federal appeals court in Washington, D.C. In order to justify his continued release, Bannon's attorney cited his intention, quote, to vigorously pursue his remaining appeals in the case. Bannon is seeking a decision on his request by June 18th, a week from now, and less than two weeks before he's scheduled to start his four-month prison stint. So we look ahead on the 18th, what do we see? Well, we see that mm, Venus is mm, quincunxing Pluto late on the 17th, early on the 18th, which is kind of interesting. So I don't know. The moon will square Pluto on the 17th. Mercury enters Cancer, which is sort of like a lot of whining, right? If we look at it negatively, please don't send me to jail, you know, but he's not a whiner. I mean, Bannon's a whiner, but he does it in a very... Mm, warlike way, right? Um, so we'll see. Yeah, Venus enters Cancer, Mercury squares Neptune, v, uh, Mercury enters Cancer, uh, Mercury conjoins Venus, and Mercury then quincunxes Pluto, and then Venus quincunxes Pluto. So that's an adjustment of some kind. So I don't know what we're going to see, but it'll probably be more about, you know, we'll be waxing towards the full moon, but it's still nearly a week away. So um, I think we'll need to wait and see. Um, but given the path of um, Peter Navarro, who tried the same kind of appeals that Bannon has, I do not think we, you know, he's going to be extremely successful and will probably end up reporting to jail on July 1st. Let's see if there's anything going on July 1st, just for kicks and giggles. No, it's Canada Day. Oh, it's a couple days before. July 1st is the day before Neptune stations retrograde. Next week I want to talk about Saturn, because Saturn's going to be stationing retrograde soon. Um, what day is that here? Let's see. Saturn will station retrograde on uh, June 29th, and then Neptune will station retrograde on July 2nd. So we're starting to see the outer station retrograde. The only one right now is Pluto, all right? So we'll talk about that at more length. But um, I want to mention a few other things before I run out of time, which is that on June 13th, as we wax toward last night's and this morning's Mercury in Gemini sextile to wounded healer Chiron in Aries, a day after the sun's sextile to Chiron, also on June 12th, there was this also from the New York Times. Justices unanimously reject challenge to Mifepristone. Supreme Court maintains broad access to abortion pill. The justices unanimously rejected a bid to sharply curtail access to a widely available abortion pill, finding that the plaintiffs did not have standing to sue. Now, to me, again, that's a square to Saturn kind of issue, right? 
Yeah, kind of mixing apples and oranges here. There's a little bit of tension here. Something's not right. Let's let's figure this out. The article goes on, the court's ruling was focused on standing and had nothing to do with the safety or morality of the abortion pill. The challenge to the FDA's approval of a widely ab- available abortion pill reflected one of the latest fronts over abortion access. So that implies that somebody or some party will more than likely try again. So again, delayed the squares to Saturn, right? But not necessarily gone. Now, interesting, isn't it, that some cases that have gone in front of the Supreme Court, such as the woman who who was a website designer who claimed that it would have been a violation of her rights to be forced to provide a wedding um, site, a website, wedding website for a gay couple, but who actually never had had that happen. No gay couple had ever asked her to build a website for them or a wedding website. And hint, that's called lack of standing. But the Supreme Court nevertheless went ahead and decided the case in the favor of the woman, regardless of the fact that she had no standing. So enough said, right? It's a pick and choose court for sure. So it'll be interesting to see, and bear in mind I'm recording this late um, in the afternoon or early evening on June 13th, if tomorrow's exact Sun-Mercury conjunction in Gemini will result in other major announcements. But to date, as this energy is waxing right now still, and on the same subject as women's rights when it comes to their health, we have this from June 13th out of the New York um, Times as well. And... uh, You know, bear in mind that Gemini is first and foremost about communication. And I quote, abortions protected by the court for now are growing rapidly. One fifth of abortions are being done via telemedicine, nearly half in states with abortion bans or restrictions. And it goes on to say the Supreme Court for now has protected telehealth abortion, which accounts for a substantial and growing share of abortions in the United States. One-fifth of abortions, an average of 17,000 per month, were done via telehealth from October through December, the most recent period for which data is available, and we have to assume that means 2023, according to WeCount, an organization that surveys abortion providers around the country. In telehealth abortions, pills are prescribed over video or via online forms and do not involve an in-person visit between a clinician and patient. The share of these abortions has grown rapidly in recent years. There were fewer than 4,000 in April 2022. And if you recall, that's when Chiron made its first return um, since 1975, when it ended the last one from 73 to 75, um, and two months before the Dobbs decision. The growth of male, and I go back to the article and I quote, the growth of mail order abortion has been one of the main drivers of the unexpected increase in abortions nationwide since the overturning of Roe versus Wade, end quote. Plus, the New York Times was on a roll yesterday with this kind of coverage, noting, and again I quote, 171,000 traveled for abortions last year. See where they went. And the article states, out-of-state trips for abortions more than doubled in 2023, demonstrating the upheaval in access since the overturn of Roe v. Wade. And these are my words. Now we might remember that the Gemini archetype also represents local, and here I'd insert domestic travel. So get this. Back to the article, I quote, more than 14,000 Texas patients crossed the border into New Mexico for an abortion last year. An additional 16,000 left southern states bound for Illinois. And nearly 12,000 more traveled north from South Carolina and Georgia to North Carolina. Now, except for the southern states to Illinois, the others are more, like I said, I mean, they're all domestic travel, but they're still not long trips, right? These were among, the article goes on, the more than 171,000 patients who traveled for an abortion in 2023, new estimates show, demonstrating both the upheaval in access since the overturn of Roe v. Wade and the limits of state bans to stop the procedure. The data also highlights the unsettled nature of an issue that will test politicians up and down the ballot in November. Hence, another plug for my upcoming talk to Arizona astrology. Um, So in relation also to the Sun-Mercury conjunction, 
um, in Gemini, which occurs, like I said, last night or as I'm speaking and tomorrow morning before this podcast airs, um, I've often noted that the sun represents the king or a head of state or an important personage, as my high school AP English teacher used to say, while Mercury, especially in Gemini, represents some kind of announcement. We have this from the Associated Press on June 13th. Quote, the United States and European countries have agreed to lock up sanctioned Russian assets in Moscow, I'm sorry, until Moscow pays reparations for its invasion of Ukraine, a senior U.S. official said Thursday. The move clears the way for leaders to announce a $50 billion loan package for Kyiv at the Group of Seven Summit, where President George Joe Biden is set to sign a security agreement with Ukraine's Vladimir Zelensky. The highly anticipated agreement will leverage interest and income from the more than $260 billion in frozen Russian assets largely held in Europe to secure a $50 billion loan from the U.S. and additional loans from other partners. The first disbursements will be made this year, but it will take time for Ukraine to use all the money, the official said. The official spoke on the condition of anonymity to preview the agreement, which will be included in the G7 leaders' communique on Friday. The leader's statement will also leave open uh, the door to confiscating the Russian assets entirely, for which the Allies have yet to secure the political will, largely citing legal and financial stability concerns. Biden will meet on Thursday, which is today, which is yesterday when you're listening to this, to discuss a bilateral security agreement between the U.S. and Ukraine as the international group of wealthy democracies has been looking for new ways to bolster Ukraine's defenses against Russia. Now, I believe, even though it's after the fact, today's the 13th and the Mars-Pluto square perfected on the 11th, I believe that a lot of this has to do with the Mars-Pluto square, all right? Mars is an attack on resources. Resources include money. And the Pluto's rulership of the natural eighth house is joint resources, so invested money. So what this group is attempting to do, because they've already frozen these Russian funds, some of them are in the United States, but the bulk of them are in European banks. So that's what they're talking about here, that the G7 meeting is at least in part about this serious topic of not only freezing the Russian money until this war is over, but in preliminarily deciding to take the money uh, to seize what it said is the interest made on this money, right? Right. So if you've got 200, what did I say, 200, where was it, 270, 260 billion in Russian, frozen Russian assets, mostly held in Europe, meaning in European banks, that they all take that and use it to um, provide collateral for the U.S. to make a loan to the Ukraine. Uh, to Ukraine, right? So you can imagine how this will enrage Vladimir Putin. But that's another story, right? Um, so in terms of all of this Geminian energy and the upcoming squares to um, Neptune next week, because as I said, on June 16th, Venus will square Neptune. And a few hours later, she will enter Cancer, um, and that's between late on June 16th and early on the 17th, and then Mercury will square Neptune later on the 17th, and he will enter Cancer, right? And then um, on June 20th, which is the day of the summer solstice, I made a mistake before too, I said it was the 21st, it's not the 21st is um, the full moon, the Capricorn full moon, but the 20th is the longest day of the year when the sun enters Cancer. But just before that, about two, three hours before that, 
the sun will square Neptune. So we have all of these planets that made the squares to Saturn, delaying things or, you know, calling in obstructions or, you know, as I said before, use the word stymieing things from going forward or just generally depressing us, right? Which, uh, you know, might be part of that only the lunations, uh, only planet in um, fire, right? Um, and all of this, all of these personal planets, the Venus and the Mercury and the sun going into Cancer, which is extremely sensitive, right? So it does feel like there may well be more um, obfuscation, more spin, right? I noticed a headline, and this came out of June 6th at the Gemini New Moon on the 7th or around then that from MSNBC data that's called, that was headline, Trump's allies are building out 2024 election denial infrastructure. And it's written by someone named Hayes Brown. I'll just read a little bit of it. Um, when former President Donald Trump lost the 2020 election, he triggered a desperate attempt to remain in office that falsely claimed Democrats had engineered widespread voter fraud. This time around, he'll lack the powers an incumbent has to use his office as weapon. No longer having those internal levers of power to pull, though, has meant only meant a shift in tactics from his allies. Remember, Gemini, I say, is all tactics but no strategy, and he just gives voice to that here. No longer having those internal levers of power to pull, though, has only meant a shift in tactics from his allies, not in their overall strategy. And as his election day rematch against President Joe Biden approaches, this infrastructure being built to legitimize a Trump loss is becoming increasingly obvious. Um, now, you know, he just goes on to talk about all, a lot of the stuff that has been done. But I want to point out also, because I want to see if it's next week. I can't remember now. Hold on. If it's not, um, I think it is. Um, hold on, because I'm in the wrong month. June. Isn't it the 20? Yeah, the 27th. So I'll be talking to you again next week on the 21st, which is the Capricorn full moon day. But on the 27th, is the first Biden-Trump debate. So I think that some of the stuff related to this, these squares to Neptune is going to be about putting out a lot of BS, right? Not that that's already ha not already happening. Saturn will be stationing to turn retrograde by the 27th of June. He does so technically on the 29th. So that's something we'll talk about next week as well. All right. Um, and in between, there are some meetings, I think, that may talk about whether that gag order is going to be lifted or not for Trump by Judge Marchant, etc., cetera, et cetera. But in any case, it's time for me to sign off now. So I'm going to say to you, thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope that you've enjoyed the information that has been presented here as you continue your karmic evolution in this lifetime. Please be sure to join me next week on June 21st for another episode of this podcast. Until then, may your journey be filled with karmic, karmic healing and the joy of greater consciousness. Namaste. Long ago, before this day's confusion did begin Throughout the stars did we go wandering Distance was no barrier, and time it had no hope. Free to come, and free to go. Free to come, and free to go.